Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us back to mountainous western Montana and the beautiful scenery of Glacier National Park. The mountains here are huge and stretch their rocky peaks into the sky. The forests on them are packed with pine, fir, spruce, and aspen trees with willow and green as well as red alder densely crowding the bodies of water in the valleys. Here white-tailed deer, moose, and elk disappear and reappear like ghosts while they search for their fodder. The large predators of this area include wolves, cougars, as well as black and grizzly bears. At 9 a.m. on Monday, August 14th of the year 2000, 26-year-old Kelly Kerpata and his 27-year-old girlfriend Kim Taffer were just four miles short of finishing their 55-mile hiking vacation. Kelly was walking slightly ahead of Kim as they chatted during the hike. Kelly was originally from Carmel, California, but relocated to Ann Arbor, Michigan to attend business school. That is where he met Kim. She was in the business program at Ann Arbor as well, and the two of them had a mutual appreciation for the outdoors. The two hikers were working on developing a budding romance and enjoyed each other's company on the hiking trip. They had put a lot of time into planning their trip to Glacier and decided to spend some time trail camping their way through some of the most beautiful parts. Before departing for their hike, they had watched a video on what to do if you encounter a bear in the backcountry at the park office. They had camped at Granite Park Campground on Sunday and were now making their way down Swift Current Pass Trail. This trail goes through the Many Glaciers area on the east side of the park. As they navigated the trail, they whistled and talked loudly with each other. They also wore bear bells and packed bear spray on their trip. As the two hikers hiked around Bullhead Lake, they rounded a bend in the trail. As the trail came into view, the hikers were terrified by the reality that a bear was sprinting toward them from only 50 yards away. They knew the bear would either stop or be on them before they would have time to react. They could see the bear reaching out with its front paws in leaps that covered 10 feet each. Kelly knew he would not be able to pull out his bear spray and decided that curling up in the fetal position and pretending to be dead was the best option. As Kelly hit the ground, Kim took a couple of steps into the bushes along the trail and curled into a ball herself, hoping the bushes may provide some kind of concealment. The angry bear immediately bore down on Kelly. His bear spray was clipped to the shoulder strap on his backpack, but the attack came on so quickly that he couldn't even get it out of the holster. The futility of the forethought of buying it for just this instance seemed bitterly ironic as he felt the bear swiping at his back and legs. With Kelly's head protected by his arms, the bear sank its canine teeth into the flesh of his thighs. It bit and clawed anything within reach as Kelly was jerked and pulled back and forth from the force of the bear's attack. The bear continued to claw his legs and hips while it drove its teeth into the same areas. For about ten seconds, the bear tore and bit at Kelly while he screamed but remained face down. Kim could see out of the corner of her eye and ominously saw the bear leave Kelly and walk over toward her. She could see a big brown blur just a few inches from her head. She refused to move or even make a sound. The bear spent a few seconds looking her over, then it turned around and walked away from the hikers. As soon as she was certain the bear had left the area, Kim scurried over to Kelly's side. His backpack was completely torn up and his sleeping roll was in tatters. He was still prone and still too worried to move in case the bear was watching nearby. Kelly and Kim tried to walk the remaining distance to finish the hike, but Kelly's injuries were too devastating. They decided to sit down and wait for someone to come along and find help for them. As they waited, they called out for help and kept a watchful eye out for the bear to return. After around 30 minutes, a park ranger overheard their shouts for help. He was just patrolling the trail area and happened to be in the perfect spot to help the hikers. The ranger administered first aid to stop the biggest sources of bleeding. He worked hard to comfort the hikers and calm them down. They were shaking and upset. He was worried about shock setting in on Kelly. Kelly's injuries were not life-threatening, so the rescuers decided not to use a helicopter to evacuate him. They initially tried to position him on a horse to ride back to the trailhead. The injuries to his hips and legs were too painful and debilitating for this to be completed, so they arranged for a litter to be brought to them. 
An ambulance was waiting for Kelly at the trailhead after the wheeled litter moved him three and a half miles down the trail. Kelly was quickly loaded into the ambulance and drove to Browning Hospital in Great Falls at about 3 p.m. on the same day. In the hospital, Kelly had several puncture wounds to his hips and legs sutured up. Several lacerations from the bear's claws were also closed, using stitches. While investigating the bear attack, bear scat was found at the scene. Investigators took samples of the scat to analyze for the presence of DNA. This might tell the investigators if they are looking for a black bear or a grizzly. It may also yield information indicating which individual bear was involved if they could connect it to a sample from a specific individual bear. Kelly had been planning to run in the Chicago Marathon in October but had to cancel the plans. He did indicate that this attack would not keep him from hiking, but he did say he would just not hike in bear country anymore. Officials indicated that the hiker's actions most likely minimized their injuries during the attack. Kim's quick thinking kept her from being injured at all. The western edge of Montana has had 11 human fatalities to bear attacks in the last 50 years. Montana has over 2,100 grizzly bears and around 15,000 black bears. Given that most of the state is farmland in the east, that puts nearly all of these bears in the western portion of the state. When Lewis and Clark came through this portion of Montana, they estimated that there were 50,000 grizzlies here, but numbers dwindled to under 1,000 at one point when they were endangered. After reviewing the details of this attack, I have a few questions for you. Do you think that bear bells do any good? Do you think the hikers let their guard down, being only four miles from the end of their long hiking trip? Why did the bear attack Kelly but not touch Kim? Do you think clipping your bear spray to your belt is better than clipping it to your backpack straps? Do you think Kelly got off relatively easy because he played dead? I will gladly read and reply to your thoughts, so please post them in the comments section below and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the lush and beautiful temperate rainforests of western coastal Canada. Oh, we are not going to the backcountry forests or trails to discuss a chance incident that led to a regrettable outcome. In fact, we don't really have to leave the town of Port Renfrew on Vancouver Island for this episode. The marina at Port Renfrew is crowded with skiffs and pontoons, and even a few small sailboats. The sailors here vary in their pursuits, which can include activities ranging from recreational sailing to sport fishing. The fish that are pursued in this area are any of the seven subspecies of salmon. Not only is the fish a favorite of humans, but the local bears like them as well. Just after 5 p.m. on Tuesday, September 9, 2008, a 52-year-old fisherman, whom we will call Sam, and his fishing partner, whom we will call Dan, were reporting their catch of coho salmon at the office of the marina. After reporting their catch, they gutted the fish by cutting open the abdomen of the salmon they had caught that day and using the sea water in the marina to wash out the blood and guts from the flesh of the fish. Gutting the fish has to be completed within a few hours of catching them, or they stand a good chance of going rotten before you can eat them. As the men walked toward Sam's boat, they watched as a strange sight occurred. They could see across the marina a black bear's head bobbing through the small waves in the water. It seemed to be coming in their direction, but black bears are a very common animal here, and bears are known for doing some pretty random things at times, so the men simply kept their eyes on the bear. The bear must have slipped their minds as they boarded their boat that was tied off to the dock at the marina. The bear had pulled itself onto the wharf and was now tailing the men down the dock from only fifty yards away. Sam was from Salt Spring Island, which is located on the east side of Vancouver Island. The human population there is very low, and many people rely on fishing for their subsistence. Seeing a black bear in the area isn't anything frightening or new to them, as they are so common. Sam suspected that the bear had come to steal their salmon. Perhaps it had seen the fish from the other side of the marina and jumped in the water to get them from the men. Or perhaps it had smelled them and decided to investigate. Either way, the black bear was now standing on the boat and was acting very aggressively toward the men. Sam decided that the fish were not worth fighting for, and in full view of the bear, threw the salmon into the water next to his boat. He expected to see the black bear dive back into the water to fetch the fish and then be on his merry way, but the bear wasn't interested in the salmon, and Sam watched as his prized catch disappeared beneath the dark waters of the marina with no reaction from the bear. 
Sam was now very concerned that this bear's intent wasn't what was expected. Normally, a bear would do anything to get a full salmon, and anyone would think that two or three of them would be that much more enticing. But the bear kept its focus on Sam, while Dan looked on from the dock. It crept slowly across the boat with its eyes focused on Sam. Now, this wasn't the first time Port Renfrew Marina had had incidents with bears showing up and misbehaving. In fact, black bears had been reported walking down the piers from time to time. They had been seen going down the ramps and even boarding boats in the marina occasionally to look for food. The marina staff never really did much about it, because at the end of each foray into the marina, the bears would inevitably leave without any serious incident. But, after today's events, a different protocol would definitely have to be adopted. The black bear slowly approached Sam before suddenly pouncing on him. It knocked him to the deck of the boat and began biting at his arm first. Sam held it out to keep the bear's teeth away from his head, which was clearly the bear's focus. After the bear chomped several dime-sized holes through Sam's arm, it worked its way up to his shoulder. It was slashing at Sam with its claws while it worked its jaws in the direction of his head. As it neared his shoulder, it clamped its jaws nearly all the way around his shoulder joint and drove its teeth deep into his muscle and bone. It was clearly intent on killing him, as it was not trying to run him off with jaw pops and chuffing. Dan yelled and kicked the bear as it stood over Sam, but the bear paid him absolutely no mind. It was focused completely on killing Sam, and nothing would draw its attention from this. Dan eventually realized this situation would require more than his yells and kicks. He began to holler toward the other fishermen around the marina. At first, they simply looked over in his direction, unsure of what was going on, but as his words began to relay what was happening, one by one, Several responders began to show up and board Sam's boat to help out. Bruce Miller was among the handful of fishermen who raced to respond to Dan's cries for help. Bruce was 40 years old at the time of this attack, and for the past six years, he was the owner-operator of his own charter called Miller Time Charters. He carried his gaff hook he used to pull large halibut aboard his boat as he hurried toward the bear attack. The gaff had a large barbless hook on the end used to snag the fish, and the hook was fixed to a long pole. Bruce used the pole's length to slam the bear with the large metal hook several times, but the bear paid no mind. Bruce estimated that he hooked the bear with his halibut gaff about ten times, but to no avail. Its sole focus was on killing Sam, and it would not be distracted. Bruce and Dan looked on, unsure of what to do next, when another fisherman ran up with a hammer and began pummeling the bear. The stubborn bear didn't react and refused to release its grip on Sam. At this point, several men were punching, kicking, and striking the bear with any implement they could get their hands on, but the bear continued its attack on Sam. Now, there is one particularly dangerous piece of equipment that nearly all fishermen carry with them. They aren't known for toting bear spray in their boats, because the likelihood of seeing a bear on your boat is virtually non-existent. They didn't have firearms, because what good would a firearm do if you weren't hunting from your boat? If you were fishing, it would just be added weight, and you may even shoot a hole in your hull if you accidentally discharged it. But every fisherman carries a filleting knife for cutting the fish fillets away from their bony carcass. These knives are typically thin metal blades that are extremely sharp and come to a very fine point. While a few of the men held the bear down, one of the fishermen plunged his filleting knife into the bear's throat. The bear didn't acknowledge the knife wound, so the fisherman began sawing at the bear's throat. The initial knife wound was likely intended to get the bear to stop attacking Sam, but when the bear didn't react as desired, the knife became a tool to end its attack once and for all. As the fisherman sawed at the bear's throat, piercing the thick hide and fur, he severed the major blood vessels that provide blood to the bear's brain. Its blood poured onto the deck of the boat, but the bear continued its focused attack on Sam. Within a few minutes, the devastating wound from the filleting knife began to take its toll on the bear. It continued to attack Sam, but with less energy and violence. It wasn't very long before the bear collapsed on the deck of the boat, dead from the wounds the knife inflicted. Sam was immediately flown by air ambulance to Victoria General Hospital, where he remained conscious and in stable condition after the attack. He was later taken to Royal Jubilee Hospital, where surgery was completed to repair some damaged tissues in his shoulder and arms. After being killed by the fishermen, the bear's corpse remained on Sam's boat until it was recovered by conservation officers. A necropsy was performed on the bear, and it was reportedly a ten-year-old male, weighing about 170 pounds. It was reportedly in poor health and was clearly underweight. 
Bruce didn't miss a day of fishing and was out on his boat the very next day. His wife said she wasn't surprised and described him as something else. When commenting about the attack, Bruce said it was clear the bear wanted to eat Sam. He stated it was very clear that nothing would stop this bear from getting what he wanted. Mike Hicks, who owned a fishing resort near Port Renfrew, stated that he wasn't surprised to hear of the bear attack. He was the citizen who called in to report the bears in the marina three weeks before Sam's attack. He was horrified to see people taking pictures at the time and shooing the bears away as if they were harmless nuisances. He stated that the disregard for the danger the bears bring was bizarre to see. When Hicks called conservation officers to request that the bears be killed or relocated, his pleas were rebuffed with the explanation that nothing could be done unless someone was in imminent danger. Hicks was disgusted after hearing of Sam's attack and how it could have been prevented. Conservation officer Gord Hitchcock stated that the fishermen needed to take responsibility for leaving trash and fish scraps around which lure the bears into the area. He continued that, if it doesn't happen, then they will just be killing bear after bear. Since 1986, eight people have been killed by black bears and 75 have been injured in British Columbia. The province is estimated to have between 120,000 to 150,000 black bears, which is among the highest populations in the world. After reviewing the facts surrounding this episode, I have a few questions for you. Do you think the authorities were negligent in not removing the bears or hazing them away from the marina? Why didn't the bear go after Sam's salmon when he threw them overboard? What made this bear focus so intently on killing Sam? Do you think the bear was in poor shape due to starvation from the overpopulation of black bears in the area? I will be glad to read and reply to your thoughts, so post them in the comment section below and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to just another one of the states in our All 50 U.S. States Bear Attacks Tour. In the state of Maryland, you might think of turtles or crabs as the most dangerous wildlife in the state, but after today's episode, you may reconsider. In northern Maryland, Gambrel State Park is a natural respite from the modernity surrounding it. The park is set on the first range of mountains rising from the lowlands that make up the eastern part of the state. It is a hub of social events for the nearby town of Frederick and features cabin rentals and tent camping sites and is crisscrossed by nature trails. Wildlife in this area includes white-tailed deer, eagles, and turkeys. Little animals like turtles, snakes, and raccoons are common. The animal that very few people count on seeing is one of the several black bears that roam the area around the park. On September 21, 2020, 55-year-old Renee Laveau was enjoying a walk in the park with her two dogs. Kylie and Bones were German shepherds and enjoyed walks with Renee nearly every day. Renee worked as a home care provider for her profession, and it afforded her a comfortable life in a setting that brought her peace and comfort. They had been coming to the park together for several years without ever encountering any bears. They didn't pack bear spray, nor did they bring a firearm on any of their walks. The area around Renee's home is surrounded by a thick expanse of forest, about three miles wide by about ten miles long. It doesn't have a lot of roads through it, and there are very few people in the area other than day hikers and campers. It is kind of this little pocket of wilderness in the middle of an otherwise modern and busy area. After a few miles of walking and enjoying the trees and scenery, Renee, Kylie, and Bones were only about a half mile from Renee's home. Suddenly Kylie's ears perked up and her head pointed at something in the bushes only about 30 yards away. Kylie dashed off to investigate while Renee looked on curiously. She probably thought it may be a raccoon or a deer, as they are both common sights in the park, but what emerged from the bushes was much more dangerous than either of these. Right when Renee saw the bear, the only thing that ran through her head was that she was screwed. She couldn't run because the bear was so close it would run her down in no time. She knew that whatever she did in the next few moments would be pivotal to her health and possibly her survival. Now Renee was no small lady. She stood five feet nine inches tall, and the bear that emerged didn't look very big. Kylie ran right up to the bear and nipped it a few times on the nose, and the bear took exception to the bites and swatted out of frustration at the dog twice with its paws. Renee thought back for a moment about how to handle a confrontation with a bear. She recalled how you should make yourself look big and yell to frighten the bear off. That is what the experts recommend after all. She raised her hands above her head and waved them around while yelling at the bear. Upon seeing her movement, the bear dropped its head 
and quickly dashed directly toward René. As the bear climbed the slight hill René was standing on, Kylie pursued the bear and bit it on the rear. The bear paid no mind to the bites, as it clearly had its eyes set on attacking René. As the bear closed to within a few yards of René, it stood to its hind legs and reached its paws toward her. She could see every detail, each claw of its paws and its teeth stood out to her as she studied the bear in fractions of a second as it walked toward her. The bear was about the same height as René and didn't seem to be a lot bigger than she was, but any bear is several times stronger than a human being. The bear growled as it closed in on René. It now was so close she could have reached out and touched its nose with her hands. As René and the bear momentarily looked at each other, the bear made up its mind. It swatted René in the chest very quickly and opened up a six-inch gash on her upper breast. As she stumbled back a few steps, the bear pushed her to the ground and bit her left leg twice just behind her knee. The bear swatted René back in the other direction so quickly that she didn't even see the bear's paw coming at her. Before she could react to the second swat, she felt the bear clamp its jaws onto the left side of her face. René heard the bones around her left eye socket cracking under the bite pressure of the bear, and she wondered what to do next. When some people face death, they say their life flashes before their eyes, but not René. The attack happened so quickly that she didn't have time to think, reflect, or even react. Immediately after hearing her facial bones cracking on the left side of her face, René felt the bear bite down on the right side of her face in about the same area. She was filled with terror as she just wanted to get away and not feel the pain of another bite from the bear. Hearing the bones of her skull crunching under the force of the bear's jaws was horrifying to her as she had no way to defend herself from the power and speed of the bear. The only thing Renee could do was to put her hands on the bear's neck and try to keep its head from being close enough for it to bite her skull again. She knew the bear was either going to kill her or she would think of a way to keep it from doing so. Since fighting the bear off was not realistic, Renee rolled onto her stomach and stopped moving altogether. She put her arms up around her head and did her best to lay still, hoping the bear would be distracted by Kylie and Bones, or lose interest in her and leave. Renee could feel her blood gushing down her face and into her hands. She knew she couldn't take much more punishment before she would lose consciousness and possibly die. As Renee lay on the ground, she could hear the bear sniffing her right ear. It rumbled a low growl right into her ear as it inspected her for signs of life. She remained still and refused to twitch as she knew it might rekindle the bear's attack. Suddenly, everything went silent. No dogs barking, no bear breathing or growling. Renee knew if she lifted her head to investigate, the bear might see her movement and renew its attack. She lay there as still as possible for about ten minutes, before slowly reaching her hand along her side while searching for her phone. Renee dug around in her pocket and pulled out her cell phone. Dialing 911, she relayed the location and injuries she had suffered to the dispatcher. It was only a few more minutes before first responders arrived on the scene to help her. Fortunately for Renee, one of her neighbors was the chief of the local fire department and was very quick to arrive at her location. By the time he got there, Renee had rolled over onto her back and sat up. Although she wasn't sure how much damage the bear had done to her face, she was relieved to see someone had come to help. The fire chief asked Renee a few questions as he looked her over. An ambulance was requested to Renee's location and arrived after only a few minutes. They loaded Renee up into the back and quickly drove her to Meredith's Hospital in Hagerstown, about 30 minutes away. The medical team performed various examinations to gauge just how much damage the bear had done to Renee's face and head. After the initial medical assessment, the medical team decided to transfer Renee to Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore by helicopter. This hospital features one of the best trauma units in the nation, and they sutured Renee's face and scalp together over the course of a four-hour surgery. The suturing was extremely painful, as Renee recounted, but she endured it. The medical team administered a local anesthetic to numb her flesh as the plastic surgeon sutured her wounds, but she could still feel the stitching as they went. Renee's wounds included the six-inch gash opened up on her chest by the bear's initial swat, deep bite wounds on her left leg, torn tissues around her left ear and scalp, as well as lacerations on her left cheek and face. The bear's jaw broke her orbital bones around her left eye during the attack as well. On the right side of her face, she had bite marks near her scalp, and the nerves near her eyebrow were severed. The pictures of Renee's attack would not be allowed according to YouTube standards, so I have posted several of them on my Patreon account, linked below. They are pretty gruesome, so if you are squeamish, don't look at them. 
Renee was released from Johns Hopkins Hospital almost two days after being admitted and was walking within a few more days. She was bruised from head to toe but was grateful to escape with the injuries she had, as the attack could have ended much worse. Renee stated that it took nearly two years for most of the sensation on her face and scalp to return. She says it feels strange when she touches the areas that are still numb. Renee now carries bear spray and wears bear bells whenever she takes Kylie and Bones out for walks. She makes a point to recommend to people she sees walking in the park to pack their bear spray and even recounts her attack to them to drive the point home when needed. She also tells them to play music or be loud so that they don't surprise any bears that may be in the area. Renee indicates that she still suffers from anxiety and visits a post-traumatic stress therapist to help her overcome her fears. Even though she is still filled with fear, she still walks her dogs on the same route as where the attack occurred. A brief investigation into the circumstances surrounding Renee's attack was conducted by local officials. They could not locate the bear and concluded it had left the area after its attack on Renee. They also pointed out that in 2020, a weather anomaly had reduced local acorn availability to bears and brought bears into residential neighborhoods and towns in search of food. Officials had issued warnings to local residents about the situation prior to Renee's attack. In the 10-year span between 2009 and 2019, black bears in Maryland were reported in over 480 nuisance calls from citizens. In the same period, farmers reported $18,400 worth of damage each year due to black bears. The most incredible statistic to me is that over 60 bears each year are struck by vehicles in Maryland. There are only 2,000 bears in Maryland, which is only about 12,000 square miles. This ratio means that there is a black bear for every six square miles, which puts black bears only half as common as in the neighboring state of New Jersey. Maryland does have a bear hunting season in its four westernmost counties. In 2007, lady bear hunter Cody Jones harvested a massive black bear that weighed 615 pounds and its skull measured 21 inches, 10 sixteenths, which is huge for a black bear. After reviewing the facts surrounding this episode, I am left with a few questions for you. Do you think Renee's attack was just a matter of her being in the wrong place at the wrong time? Or am I missing something? Why didn't Kylie and Bones defend Renee? Do you think Renee lifting her arms and making noise to frighten the bear instigated the attack? Did you know that something as simple as a bad acorn season could put bear populations under such stress? I will be glad to read and reply to your thoughts, so post them in the comments section below and let's talk about it. Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider clicking on the like button and clicking on the bell icon. We'll help you know when we post our new episodes. Posting our video links to your social media profiles furthers awareness, and it's fun. We slashed our prices in our merch store, linked below. So check out the bargains there while you shop. As a member of our human community, remember to adventure bravely and be careful out there, especially in bear country.